Let's start in prayer, shall we? Lord, may your message be poured out today. May the Holy Spirit rain down on us this morning and and warm our souls. May we be stirred by your presence and have your words marinate on us this week to bring us closer to you. May your will be done now and forever in the lives of each and every one of us today. Amen. Amen. So to start off, I'd like you to have some thinking time and some chatting to the person next to you. And if you're at home in your Udi and your um, in your Ugg boots, you can chat to the person next to you. Um, I'd like you to chat about the two questions that will be coming up on the screen any moment. Here we go. Have a chat to the person next to you for two minutes, please. What has been marinating in your heart so far during this series? Or what has made you uncomfortable during this series? Go ahead and have a chat to the person next to you. Okay. Sometimes we need to embrace the squirm. And I feel that throughout this series, I have squirmed a few times. Am I alone in that? Have I got some other people that have squirmed a bit? Yeah, some heads nodding. Awesome. So in order to better understand... Uh, the Bible and the meaning of how it relates to my life, I like to go back to the context and I like to almost teleport back and transport back into what was happening at the time, what was written, why was it written and what does that mean to my life now. So a quick teleportation back. Um, James was the brother of Jesus, as we know. We do have some pictures coming up in a minute. James was the brother of Jesus and at the point in time when this was written, he was the leader of the church in Jerusalem and there was a really massive divide between the rich and the poor, the haves and the have-nots. At the time, widows were quite prevalent in society as were orphans, as well as um, labourers and the Sadducees who were the rich priests And the rich priests really did make their money from ripping off these labourers. But they would all go to church and they would all be together at church. Throughout the book of James, James has been talking to both the rich and the poor. It's okay if the pictures don't come up. That's all right. James was talking to both the rich and the poor at the same time. And the similarities between the church then and the church now aren't that different. Throughout the series of James, we've come to understand that everyone has trials. Everyone endures trials and those trials really do lead to the maturity that we have in Christ. We've learnt throughout the last couple of weeks that we need to listen more than we speak. We need to put our faith into action And we're reminded not to favour people, not to favour them based on their status. Have pure, unadulterated faith like Rahab or Abraham. And through all of this, James has constantly reminded us and given us really rich instructions of what we need to do. He hasn't just been talking to the poor or the rich. He's been speaking to both. And at some points, it just feels like he's reprimanded the rich. I'm not sure about you, but throughout times during this series, I've squirmed because I've been both the poor and the rich. I can imagine what they would have felt at the time as well. 
And I don't know if I'm alone, but I've squirmed in knowing that I've had to be frugal, frugal at times and I've stored my riches, but I've branded that money smart. And last week, Ryan really hit me in the face with that and I squirmed very uncomfortably. I know that at times when I've seen professional looking people walk into a space, I've held my shoulders back a little bit higher. I've done that. I've favoured people based on the outside, not the inside. Am I alone in that? Have I got anyone else that's willing to admit that? Yeah? Okay. I don't feel so alone now. As Ryan illustrated last week, it's really easy to switch off through the book of James when we hear him talking about the rich people because we don't necessarily classify ourselves as rich. But most of us were in the top 10 or 1% of today's riches. James was talking to the church back then and giving them the same message that he's giving us today. He's giving us really clear instructions on how to live and respond to the world. How to live and respond through trials and tribulations. And it's not through vengeance. And it's not through unrealistic promises. But through faith and through works that demonstrate how to love thy neighbour. But my goodness, love is hard, isn't it? Love can be painful. It can be filled with trials. It can be filled with pain. And through love, suffering comes too. Have you ever had to love someone who has wronged you? It's what we're called to do. To love them, not just forgive them. We don't just forgive their wrongdoings. We are called to love them, to show them love. James says in chapter 2, 24, a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. I think this question's incorrect. I think it's incorrect because most of the time we go to the easy people, our husbands, our wives, our children, our parents, other family members perhaps. We're bound to them through commitment. So it's easier to love them again because they're in our space, they're in our world. After they do us wrong, we are committed to them still. So we do learn to love them and forgive them at the same time. But I think this should be the question. How? Do you love someone that has wronged you? I struggle with this question on the daily. I suffer through the pain that loved ones have caused. But what I'm really, really good at doing is crossing the bridge and burning it so I don't have to go back there. And then I like to put them in the little box that is the forget box, not the forget me nots, but the forget box. And I forget about it. I can forgive and God has really helped me with part of my forgiveness. And he's helped me compartmentalise things. But he hasn't made them disappear from my life. And when their very existence comes into my space, their physical presence is near me, I burn because the lid of that box pops open. He's working within me to help me love because I constantly question God how do I love that person I'm still suffering through the pain that they've they've caused me I've forgiven their actions but I can't love them again and I think the answer to this is in today's message James 5 7 to 12 patience in suffering be patient then brothers and sisters until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. 
the judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need to do is say a simple yes or no. Otherwise, you will be condemned. I tried to look for a good joke about patience, but I'm still waiting. Thank you. <laughs> patience. I hear this word and it's, this word annoys me just as much as the word calm annoys me. When someone says, just be calm. How? Please be more specific. Or just show respect. How? Be more specific. Patience. I then say, how? Be more specific. But I don't think that James could get any more specific than what he does here. Let's have a look at the first part where he talks about the farmer. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop. My dad was a farmer. He tirelessly tended his crop and eventually would reap the rewards of what he sowed. And as an outsider, it looked easy. I was the youngest of four kids. So I had to stay inside and wait for the phone to ring and everyone else had to go outside and tend to the crop and water and weed and all that sort of business. It looked easy for me. You sow the seeds, you water them, they grow. Do we have any veggie patch people here? Any green thumbs here? Yeah, green thumbs, respect. Respect, honestly, respect. I tried to grow a veggie patch um, when I moved into the new house and I planted in a two by one metre rectangular box beans, tomatoes, lettuce and zucchini. I thought I was going to have a marvellous marvellous crop of fresh veggies to share with family and friends. And my mum came over and laughed at me and I said, what's, what's the laughing for? And she said, you'll see, sweetheart. So I had to wait patiently for what she was trying to convey to me. What was she talking about? My veggie crop yielded two cherry tomatoes <laughs> that I plucked off the vine and ate before all the bugs got to them and three beans. <laughs> Everything else died. <laughs> it died either because I was impatient or because I put it in the forget box. I secretly hoped that it would all come back if I just left it there because I initially killed half of the crop because I watered it too much. I didn't know that you needed to work on that. I didn't research how much water was actually required. I didn't know how much space I needed between them. I just sort of threw the seeds in and away I went. Um, I didn't consider the quality of the soil or the impact that frost was going to have and, and the directionality of the sun and where it needed to be. I put it in a spot where I wanted it to grow and look pretty because it was like I've got a little garden, you know. It needed to look right. <laughs> I treated my crop like I treated my harmed relationships. I forget. The farmer doesn't sow seeds and stop working, does he? He continually tends to his crop. He checks on the soil. He checks on the conditions. He works out the dryness and the frost and the weather. He measures the water. He considers the conditions for growth, all while waiting patiently. In this message, I think here we learn something really important. How do we develop patience? We need to work while we wait. We need to work on ourselves. We need to pay attention to our feelings and our emotions. And we need to balance them really carefully, measure what we allow in. We need to pay attention to what we're paying attention to. 
We need to pray on our inside life, not just on the wishes and dreams that we have. We need to feed the weather of our soul, just like a farmer does. He feeds, he feeds the soil, he feeds the crop, he works while he waits. Do we say a prayer and wait for God's miraculous gifts, like he's a vending machine? Or do we pray and work through those prayers? In order to develop patience, we need to work while we wait. And I really do believe that's why James has used the farmer as our first example of how to develop patience. To have prophetic patience, we need to embrace the wait and the work. We need to take charge and, and speak out against the wrongdoings. We need to see and experience what's going on in our lives and speak up in the name of the Lord. Pray, embrace, work while we wait. Next, we're giving the example of the prophets and we're also giving the example of Job. As an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We move on and it says, You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. I'm not going to focus on Job um, because that's a whole series in and of itself. And we do know what happened with Job and the perseverance and patience that he went through. And interestingly, it doesn't talk about which specific prophets here. It doesn't talk about the minor prophets or the major prophets. It says the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. They were examples of patience in suffering. So I've looked at two prophets. The two that came to mind for me were Daniel and Jeremiah. Daniel, the future vision teller through dreams, he was both persecuted and revered. Nebuchadnezzar um, really revered him for his ability to read his dreams, um, but, but others also then persecuted him. And he was sent to the lion's den where he was supposed to be killed. That, that level of suffering, walking into the lion's den, he did not show what he was feeling because he knew that Jesus was there with him. He was sent into the fire to be killed, but there was someone else in the fire with him. It must have been agonising for him as someone who predicts the future because the wait is in waiting to see if it actually happens. Was that my misunderstanding or was this actually true? He patiently persevered through the wait. He worked through the wait through prayer. He persevered in the face of suffering. And then I think about Jeremiah, um, the weeping prophet. At the time, he was preaching to the church in uh, Judea and they were all turning away and um, being involved in idolatry worship. And for 40 years, he preached to them. And it's said that within those 40 years... He didn't have a single convert. Can you imagine your entire adult life doing a job and not having one person turn and say, hey, I was thinking about what you said. Not a single one. 40 years. Now that there is patience. Jeremiah was rejected and imprisoned, and through it all he persevered. I cannot help but wonder how many people during those 40 years he had to learn to forgive and love again. He wasn't paid attention to, but God picked him as a prophet and gave him the strength to continue. 
He was rejected time and time and time again. It's no wonder they call him the weeping prophet. How many people did he need to re-love? He was a loving man who displayed patience instead of vengeance. He could have easily have thrown his hands up and walked away after the first 40 minutes, but he held on for 40 years through the love of Jesus. Through James's example, when we reflect on the prophets, I'm reminded of where God meets us. And it's usually right at the peak of our suffering, isn't it? He didn't meet Daniel before he walked into the fire. He met Daniel in the face of the fire. That's where God meets us, at the height of our suffering. He makes himself known. He speaks to us in quiet whispers, right at the very height, the very pinnacle of our pain. When we're in the midst of suffering, it's quite easy to turn inward and say, I've done something wrong. This is my fault that I'm here. I, I must have done something. Me, 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 me. At the first speed hump in suffering, we try and find a U-turn. We forget about perseverance. We forget about patience. And we immediately start to whinge and to whine. We do exactly what James tells us. We grumble against one another. And James tells us not to do that. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a very big difference between talking to people for support and grumbling, whinging and whining. Any parents here know the difference between when your child talks to you and when your child whinges and whines? Yeah? Okay. You know what I'm talking about then. But I'm going to be a little bit harsh and say, well, why not you? Why are you above suffering? Aren't you a child of God? Didn't Jesus suffer? So why are you any, more, any better than Jesus? Suffering comes with being a Christian. It's promised in 2 Timothy 3. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. When I first became a Christian, I thought I was taking the easy road. Little did I know I was taking the hard, windy, bumpy road. And that's the reason why. Because it comes with suffering. Because we are here to proclaim the mystery of Jesus and the fact that he can forgive us without us knowing him, or so we think. Through grace comes beauty and life. The book of Romans tells us to rejoice in suffering. Again, the question is, how? I don't think that when Daniel walked into that fire, he was clicking his heels together and saying, yee I don't think that's the rejoice that Romans is talking about here. I think the rejoice is knowing that you're one step closer to God. I believe that we rejoice through that suffering because we are granted a moment with Jesus. In the words of Billy Graham, the will of God will never lead you where the grace of God cannot keep you. At the peak of my personal suffering, the physical and psychological pain that I was going through in my life at one point, it was almost unbearable. And in the middle of the night, at the peak of my suffering, I felt the physical presence of the Lord. He wrapped his arms around me like a father rocking or nursing a child to sleep. He held me tight and he told me everything was going to be okay. He reassured me, this is my will. And I can just hear those words over and over and over again. He 
he told me that I was okay. He didn't tell me it was the end. It took two years to get up to that peak of suffering, if not a bit longer. And I thought that was the U-turn roundabout part and I'd go back to, no, no. It continued, I had to go down the other side of that hump. And that's where the rejoicing came because I knew I was no longer by myself. So what does all of this mean? What message is God sharing with us? To develop patience, we need to work while we wait. And as we're working and waiting, we need to remember that that's the point where God will meet us in the midst of that suffering. Rejoice in that suffering because he is here. Through the epistle of James, God is telling us to pull up our socks, have faith, be faithful. Don't separate your faith from your deeds. Be a straight shooter. Be a trustworthy person. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. That's what that sentence means. If you're going to say yes to something, say it wholeheartedly and mean it because it's okay to say no. No matter what, loving Christ will lead to suffering. It's promised. You will be persecuted. People will hurt you. But you have a duty to love them still. And the only way you can continue to love them after being hurt is through patience. Jesus is here for you. Even when you can't feel him, he is always here for you. So today I ask you to think really carefully about the message. What do you need to take on board for this study as we come to the end? I invite you to close your eyes, please. I want you to have a think and a tussle in yourself with Jesus. Based on this message, based on the book of James, in regards to your trials and your sufferings, how do you need to pull your socks up? <laughs>